my name is Harvey Richer. I'm a professor in physics astronomy here at UBC. And I welcome you to this uh, very special public lecture. Um, what's been happening here for the last uh, three days, and will continue until Friday, is that under the auspices of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, um, UBC is hosting um, a small group of international scholars from around the world. And we're sitting around the table, and we're having the most fun I think some of us have ever had in our life. And what we're doing is we're talking about time and life in the universe. So there's people here that are cosmologists that study the large-scale structure of the universe. There's people here that study planets and perhaps where life will be discovered elsewhere in the universe because irrespective of what you read in the grocery store newspapers, life has not been discovered elsewhere in the universe yet. And we have philosophers, and we have mathematicians, and we have people with an enormously wide range of interest sitting around and discussing and giving talks about time and life in the universe. And as part of this whole po program, there is a public lecture associated with it, and that's what's happening tonight. So, in fact, since the name of our, we call it a round table, since the name of our round table is time and life in the universe, we thought we ought to have someone who would talk about time in the large scale cosmology of the universe, and then someone who would talk about life in the universe. And that's exactly what we have. So we have two speakers, and the first speaker is Grasa Roca, right over here. Um, Grasa is a staff scientist at the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory in um, in California, associated with uh, Caltech. Um, she's done important fundamental work on cosmology, and she'll be talking um, tonight about what we know about the universe, the structure, the chronology, and so on. And after her talk, we have Pascal Lee, and Pascal Lee is a scientist with the SETI Institute. SETI is, stands for, it's an acronym that stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Can't get nicer and more interesting than that. And he's also the founder of the, what's called the Mars Institute. And uh, Pascal studies, he's basically looking for evidence of life on Mars. Um, I first met uh, Pascal when he was working up uh, in Nunavut on a thing called Devon Island, which is a cold, dry place up in northern Canada. And it's a terrific Mars uh, analogy. It has a big volcanic area, and it's cold, and it's very dry, just like Mars is. It's a little different. It has an atmosphere and so on. Um, but he was using that to try and understand something about life on Mars. So we'll begin with Grasa. Um, we won't take, quite, there's of course time for questions. We won't take questions between the two, but we'll let both our speakers talk, and then we'll take questions that you can ask either one or both um, to comment on some question that you might have. So I present to you Grasa Roca, who will be talking about what we know about the universe. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to, to talk and give this lecture uh, here at the University of British Columbia. Uh, so I appreciate very much the invitation. I hope you enjoyed the ride. Let's see. OK, so what I'll be talking today is about the structure of the universe. And I'll be doing that uh, specifically as seen through the eyes of a satellite, uh, the Planck satellite. And that's why I, see, I say through the eyes of the Planck satellite. And I'll explain in a minute why I'm doing that. But first of all, let me start by addressing or trying to address a few questions, the questions we are in particular interested in cosmology to answer. And uh, things like, for example, how much mass and what type of mass is there? What is the overall geometry of the universe? How big is it? How old? Etc. and so on. And what I'll be uh, addressing is how much have we learned about the universe so far? through the observations, so a specific observation, observing the, the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Okay? And uh, as I said, in particular, through the eyes of this mission, the Planck satellite, this is a, is a mission with significant participation of NASA, 
It was launched in 2009 from the French Guayanas. And in fact, it uh, died, or if you want, it was killed to die at 3 a.m. in the morning. So it was switched off, and we have been living through the very last moments of, 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 of Planck. And uh, I want to show just, if you go to the web and you browse and look for Planck, you can see here, for instance, said, and this is actually our web, uh, website in Caltech, uh, last command sent to Planck Space Telescope. So after nearly 4.5 years of scanning the skies for the oldest light in the universe, the Planck telescope has been switched off. This, for many uh, of the Planck team members, is a quite, sh quite uh, uh, emotional moment and memorable moment because they dedicated a great part of their lives to the, this project and to cosmology. But let me start, first of all, by uh, mentioning that for almost 50 years, the cosmic microwave background radiation has been one of the most important sources of information about the universe uh, at large. But let, let me start by reviewing what we've learned so far. First of all, the universe used to be hot and dense. There is no credible alternative to a Big Bang. Very early on, it is plausible that the universe expanded really fast for a very short time. Something like inflation happened. There is a lot of invisible matter in the universe, the so-called dark matter. But what is the CMB exactly? As I said earlier, this is the oldest light in the universe, emitted 370,000 years after the Big Bang, after the initial explosion. And at this time, you have mostly hydrogen, helium, a little deuterium, and a trace of lithium, all ionized, plus dark matter. And dark matter is basically the stuff that has no electromagnetic interactions, only gravity. Matter and radiation were in equilibrium, therefore you expect radiation to have a black body spectrum. Temperatures are of the order of 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and the universe is opaque. You can't see anything. It's like the fog that you have seen last days here, so you can't see anything around you. But let's, let me go now a bit more in detail here. Let's now go just a little above 3,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? So a little hotter than the candle flame. At this time, there are no atoms because everything is banging together so hard that uh, electrons and nuclei can't stay together. On the other hand, it's opaque, and it's opaque because light cannot travel far without being absorbed uh, by an electron, which then emits more light. So at this time, the universe is filled with white light. But the universe is expanding and cooling, and therefore a little bit later and a little bit cooler, what do you see? You see hydrogen, helium, and lithium became stable. It's what we call the recombination period, where atoms recombine. The universe is transparent to most wavelengths, and light can travel almost without impediment. Okay? What do we see 13.8 billion years later? We see light coming from a shell around us of radius 13.8 billion light years. And this shell around us is what we call, usually call last scattering surface, because it's represents the instant that uh, uh, photons are last scattered by electrons. Because of expansion, this radiation is highly redshifted, and therefore no longer a white glow, but a really very cold glow that our eyes cannot see. The temperature of this radiation today is of the order 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Now, why is the CMB so, uh, so important? It is important because we see directly how the universe was like very early on, when it was really an infant uh, universe. It was like, uh, you know, um, like a little, let's say, a little, a little child. You know, it was very, very young. And the universe then was very simple. It was composed most by basic constituents. There is no chem chemistry. So here I just display the, the, the basic constituents, as you can see. It's just a repetition of what I just said before. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> ah, excellent. Thank you. Um, of course, the physics is, we have well understood the physical conditions. So, temperature of the order of 3,000 degrees Kelvin, high vacuum, extremely uniform. However, it was very early on realized that in order to see the structures we see today, uh, this could not be completely uniform. There will be there will have to be some sort of fluctuation, some sort of deviations from this uniformity to some level. And the reason is a very, very, very tiny little perturbation of the order of one part in 10 to 5. 
In this period of time, everything is so-called linear regime. It's very simple because it's straightforward to calculate how matter and radiation behave as, um, as a function of many parameters, and I'll mention this later on in the talk, that you would like to know. So we can, in fact, calculate what the CMB would look like as a function, for instance, of how much mass, what sort or type of mass or matter you have, what is the overall geometry of the universe, how old and how big, and so on. Really fundamental basic things. And then we compare with what we observe and work out all those basic things. So we compare the models and the theories that uh, explain the structure formation of the universe compared to the observation and single out and try to understand which one actually explains better observations. So as I was saying earlier, this radiation shows us directly the simple early universe. Okay? And note that this early universe is determined by fundamental physical processes that happened 10 minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. But all of these, and in particular this period of time, is a starting point for the further evolution of everything. And now what I'm showing here is actually an image of how this radiation looks like as seen through Planck. As you can see, it looks like noise mostly. And indeed what we are looking at are these tiny little fluctuations in the temperature of the radiation that otherwise will be uniform of the order 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Okay? And you have this cold blue and red orange uh, uh, spots, and all these spots just represent these fluctuations, which are nothing else but fluctuations in the overall density. Uh, some regions are more dense than others. And uh, in fact, uh, from these regions uh, is actually where all the structure we see today, uh, you know, uh, stars, uh, uh, cl uh, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies emerged. So in trying and learning how to analyze this map, we can actually infer quite a lot about the universe. <clears throat> but not only that. So we're looking, when you look at that map, you're looking at a snapshot of the universe very young, very early on. But not only that, we also see, and here is again this last scattering surface in the back, and uh, as the light travels to us, okay, so we are here, here is Planck for example, <laughs> as light travels to us on this, its 13.8 billion year journey, it learns about intervening parts of the universe as well. As we all know, uh, matter bends light, this is gravitational lensing, and what we will see here is that the photon, instead of going in a straight line over here, it wiggles to and fro as it interacts with intervening material that in, in, in the meantime is being formed. Studying these little wiggles, uh, these very tiny little wiggles in, the, in this uh, CMB radiation, we can actually infer the distribution of matter, of all this structure in between us and last scattering surface. And of course then reconstruct what we call the lensing potential of the universe if you want. So just to give you a bit of an idea what is our understanding at the moment of the history of the universe, here is a snapshot of that, it's a little cartoon. And the idea here is, uh, so what you are looking in this direction is just the expansion of the universe as a function of time. And the idea in very, 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 um, um, how do you say, broad strokes, if you want, is the following. Everything begins, begins with a big bang. This is followed by a very uh, a fast expansion, a very short period of time called cosmic inflation. As this time, these perturbations, these tiny fluctuations in the otherwise, otherwise uniform plasma, if you want, or background, emerge, sort of quantum fluctuations emerge in this period of time. And later on, what you see is that ordinary matter particles, are ordinary matters like uh, baryonic matter that you and I and stars are made of, uh, are tightly coupled to photons, and the dark matter particles start building structures. Okay, there is this matter that, as I said, doesn't have uh, electromagnetic interaction, only uh, acts through gravity. 370,000 light years, uh, sorry, years after the Big Bang, you have the recombination period. And at this time, of course, what you have is that um, the protons and electrons uh, uh, get together, forming uh, atoms of hydrogen, for instance, helium, etc. And the CMB photons are freely released at this point. And this is exactly what we are looking at in this period of time. Soon after the recombination, uh, what starts happening is, uh, emerges, if you want, is the dark, the period of dark ages, when the ordinary matter is just falling uh, to, the, to, the, to the structures created by dark matter, to the potential wells, if you want, gravitational potential wells formed by uh, this, this, this dark matter. And it is not until 200 million years after the Big Bang 
that the first uh, stars and galaxies form. Okay? From that point onwards, uh, you know, we start creating structures and you start creating uh, galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies and so on. And here is today. Now let's try to zoom to this region today. And if you zoom here in this particular position on the sky side, you see that you can, you have an, uh, clusters of galaxies, a, a set of galaxies here. And then if you zoom another point here in this cluster of galaxies, you see emerging a galaxy, galaxy spiral galaxy. Then let's look at a very unimportant location somewhere in the spiral arm. And what we will see, which is not in this plot, but we'll see is our system, is our solar system. This is where we are living. What I'm trying to show here is that with Planck and with the CMB radiation, we observe this area here, this particular instant in time. But from that instant of time, we can extrapolate what, how, how the universe looks like very early on. At the same time, it informs us how the universe should look today and in some way predict its future. But now, because I'm talking about CMB, I would like to give a bit, uh, given that uh, Planck now is died, I would like to, in honor of it, talk a bit about the instrument and explain, uh, as I will try to convey uh, during this talk, is what do you know about the universe? And I'll give you the numbers if you want. But I think it's interesting as well is to understand how do we get to these numbers? How do observers actually get this information from the data? And that's what I'm going to do now. So this is an image from uh, the Planck Satellite Telescope, which is a third generation CMB space mission after COBE that was launched in 1981 and WMAP launched in 2001. Planck itself, as I said earlier, was launched in 2009 in French Guiana and uh, has been surveying the sky for 4.5 years, of course. No one. In some ways, Planck is a time machine in the sense that looking into that particular region in particular time, a look at this ancient radiation, you are actually looking back in time and learning about the very, very, very long, long, long past and about the future as well. So uh, the primary scientific goal of this uh, instrument was uh, to measure temperature and isotropies or fluctuations of the CMB to fundamental limits, basically saying to a very, uh, you know, down to very uh, small angular resolution of the order of five arc minutes and of course, a very, if possible, very high or large signal to noise in the instrument. It measures in nine wavelengths or nine frequencies, if you want, from the 30 gigahertz to 857 gigahertz. And this is mostly because we have to deal with certain things, because we don't actually see directly this light, given that there is a, our own galaxy. And in fact, our own galaxy is on the way to see this ancient radiation. And you have actually to clean, if you want to clean uh, uh, the, the maps in order to actually reveal this, this ancient light. And that's why you need to observe such a wide range of frequencies. So basically the idea here is the satellite is spinning around this spin axis and same time it's scanning the sky. Of course, this is a cartoon impression. It seems like the satellite is creating the CMB. It's not the case, I can assure you. We are observing it. And this is basically the map that you will get in the end, which has contributed by many radiations, not only by this ancient light. What you are seeing here in this region, mostly this region, is actually a radiation from, from our own galaxy. And before I move on to explain how we actually reveal this ancient light, I just want to, go to, 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 to show you how, looking at a particular same region of the sky, how this same region of the sky looks different as seen by the different three uh, satellites from COVE, WMAP to Planck. And mostly the difference is in terms, given in terms of resolution, you can see uh, smaller and smaller and smaller uh, uh, perturbations, smaller angular scales, and you can see them uh, in a much more uh, native fashion. So you get at the same time a larger resolution and sensitivity. And maybe your eyes cannot really see it, but we can see it when we, for instance, analyze our data or in some ways we Fourier transform our data. This is actually a quite a dramatic improvement in, in the quality of the data. But as I say, uh, when you observe the sky, and this is true for Planck and for other CMB experiments anyway, uh, you don't see this light directly. What you do see is uh, this sort of maps. We have three beautiful <laughs> maps uh, that are at independent frequencies here from 30 gigahertz to 857 gigahertz. 
and they contain the contribution from different, uh, for different type of foregrounds, for the different type of radiative processes from our own galaxy. As you can see, just to give you an example, you see this region around the galactic plane, this is very much just emission of a galaxy. It decreases a lot when you go to very high frequencies, of course. But you can already, though, see in the very high galactic latitudes, you see these sort of dots, blue and orange, and this is already on its own right pristine CMB radiation. Now, how do we clean this? How can we, from this map, as you say, see from these nine maps, create that single map that uh, seems so, so nice, just to show in the tiny little fluctuations temperature of the CMB? We do that because uh, mostly the, the CMB radiation and the galactic radiation behaves very different, differently in frequency. They have a different spectral signature. And because they have a different spectral signature, we can basically separate them. But to do it well, we need to have a wide range of frequencies. If you have a small range of frequencies, you might not be describing very well one particular radiative process, for instance, synchrotron and a radiation emitted by uh, particles of dust, for example. So uh, you need that, and that's exactly what this particular uh, Planck uh, uh, offered us, was a coverage of very wide wavelength, which allowed us to get this data with unprecedented quality. And that's how, in a way, if you want, we go from this map, as I shown earlier, with all this contribution, all this radiative process, to something like that, that's the, the CMB. And let me show now just a cartoon. Of course, that's not exactly how we do it, but it's a cartoon that helps a bit to understand how we go from this map to actually reveal the, C, the CMB light. It's not easy, okay? So this cartoon, as you can see, this map is contributed by all these uh, radiative processes from individual sources, radio emission from our Milky Way, dust emission from the Milky Way, and of course the cosmic microwave background. So it's all emissions at microwave and submillimeter wavelengths. And hopefully the, it will start from the beginning. So let's start by isolating these individual sources. So we try to look at individual sources, this is what it looks like, and you try to peel it off. Then you try to uh, isolate uh, the radio emission from the Milky Way, and this is what it looks like. You remove it. Finally, we look at dust emission from our own galaxy. This is what it looks like. And we remove it, cut it off. And this is what's left behind. So a beautiful, beautiful CMB map. And from this beautiful CMB map, that's where we actually extract all the information we gathered about the universe. So let me go a bit bits in technicalities, but are quite useful. Um, so for that you, you believe in our work in a way. Um, so in this map here, as I said, there is a wealth of information. And for most angular scales, one part of the sky looks very much like another, okay? So we can work out the average noise power on different angular sizes, okay? And this is what technically is called power spectrum. So let me start by extracting a small region of the sky from this blank map. And this region of sky here uh, is contributed by many, uh, uh, as I say, for, by uh, perturbations at different angular sizes. In this plot here on the right hand side, the yellow curve is the angular power spectrum of this map. And this pink band here, if you want, this pink filter here, represents the angular sizes of the fluctuations you see on the left hand side map. And now see what happens when I slide this pink uh, filter from left to right from large angular scales to smaller angular scales. Ah. As the pink filter slides from left to right, you see that the spots here get smaller and get brighter as you approach the, this first peak here. Past this first peak, you see they get smaller and fainter. So basically what the pink filter is doing is filtering out uh, the sizes of the perturbations going from very large angular scales, one degree scale, and then arc minute scale. So basically, that's what we do. So when we estimate the angular power spectrum of CMB, what we are doing is how the amplitude of the fluctuations vary with size. But in doing that, we can then reconstruct this yellow curve and then compare this yellow curve, this angular power spectrum, with prediction from models of structure formation. And you can see that this curve has loads of features, as a plateau here, as acoustic peaks, and then damps. So this is from these features that we can actually then uh, infer uh, the values of these cosmological parameters that you are interested in. 
Just to give an example, suppose I'm interested in understanding how much matter in the universe uh, is in the universe. What I want to show here is how this angular power spectrum of this radiation will change depending on the value or the amount of matter you have in the universe. So as you increase this quantity, you see that the amplitude of the peaks and the, the ratios of the odd and even peaks change and somehow the shape. So let me do it again. There you go, increases. Then it decreases again and starts seeing the increased amplitude of the peaks and the variation of the ratio between the even and odd peaks. So you can see that this curve is very sensitive to amount of matter that you actually have in the universe. And that's exactly by doing this, by fitting different values of this quantity and comparing with our observations, that when you can say, oh, omega, omega mg squared, which is a parameter you use for matter, say, the, the matter parameter density, um, is this value it cannot be that one. And then, of course, you can also infer uncertainties in this parameter. One thing that you should be aware of is that sometimes there are combinations of parameters that are degenerate, which means that two different numbers of these parameters can vary so that they uh, um, conspire to give exactly the same curve. And uh, of course, then it's a bit difficult because then you don't know which one is which. And that's why it's very important to cover as a wide range of angular sizes as possible to break these sort of degenerates because obviously there are details in one region of this power spectrum that are different from the other power spectrum, so we can separate them. And that's another thing that this instrument offered us was a wide coverage of these, uh, uh, of these angular sizes and allowing for us to be get better constraints on these parameters. And finally, here is actually what we measured with instruments. And here I'm just showing the data. This is our power spectra from the data. You can see one, two, how many peaks do you see in this picture? Seven. <laughs> you can almost see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven almost, right? So um, you, you see that this is actually very telling. And uh, the thing is, uh, these dot, red dots and the arrow bars go through all that with this uh, wide range of angular scales, as you can see, up to the arc minute scales. And what I want you to uh, take out of this picture is the following, is that when I look at very large angular scales here, in this region here, uh, there is not much uh, we can do. Uh, there's not, there is nothing we can do better than this. Okay, this is already what we can do uh, as, best as best as possible because we reach the limit of precision. However, when you go uh, to the right hand side for scales uh, size smaller than one degree, um, this region is mostly dominated by what we call the noise right, in the instrument. And look at the arrow bars. You cannot see the arrow bars, right? And you cannot see the arrow bars because they are as large as the red dots themselves. And this is basically due to the fact that the, the noise in the Planck uh, maps is very low. And this is what we call precision cosmology. And this is actually really very important to get the precision we need uh, to know the, the, the values of these cosmological parameters. But the, the most amazing thing is not we measure power spectra, we compare with models. But what is a remarkable, say, is that we actually find a match. So from the suite or the set of models we have, we can actually find one that fits well the data. And here I'm showing, for instance, this green, green uh, line here is going uh, almost, uh, you know, I'll say, almost through all the data points. Okay? This is our match. And in fact, what we realized, and this is going now to the description of the universe, that a, a very simple six-parameter model describes very well and, and fits very, essentially perfectly the data. And uh, basically, um, I'm saying here what universe he is, and I don't know if you are very familiar with this uh, terminology, but basically it's a, a, a universe where uh, the cold dark matter dominates in the background. You have, uh, the, sorry, cold dark matter, and the dark energy dominates in the background that causes the uh, uh, late acceleration of the universe. And on top of this background, you do have fluctuations of this, uh, the density and the temperature, which uh, has a, uh, distribution of energy as a power law spectrum, and et cetera. But I'm not going into details here. It's not very, very relevant for the rest. Here is just to give you a current state of the art, if you want, with the Planck, WMAP, SPT, and ACT, um, going through all this uh, up to L of 3000. Now, but the question to ask is, what have we learned about the universe? After I've shown you how we actually do analyze that, really. So um, at the moment, what we found is that, in particular, what we found is that there is more matter and less dark energy than we thought, uh, previously thought. 
And here what I'm showing is the proportions found after Planck. And the proportions are uh, in the ordinary matter uh, is 4.9%, dark matter is around 26%, and the majority of that in the form of this mysterious dark energy, 68%. And here I'm showing you some parameters. These are parameters that we uh, get, of course, from the data, in particular one here is the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years. Uh, also, we now realize that, uh, of course, we get the consistency with the universe that is flat, 2% uh, uh, level. And uh, I want to say another parameter, which is the H naught or the Hubble parameter that gives information about the rate of expansion in the universe is, for instance, given here, this quantity here. But what I want to call your attention from here is not only the, the values of the parameters, but the error bars, the uncertainties, and see how small they are. Once again, this is cosmology, uh, precision cosmology, and it's important. So basically, the universe is different from what we thought, or if you want, it was, is slightly different from what we thought. It's a little bit older, 13.8 billion years versus 13.7 billion years, as thought beforehand. It's expanding a little more slowly, and this is uh, determined by this value of H0 here, as more matter and less dark energy. But we also try to go beyond these parameters. We try to go beyond the, 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 the six-parameter model, and in, per, in particular trying uh, to search for potential new physics. But what we find, in fact, is that, for example, we don't find any evidence so far for a time variation varying dark energy. This is usually parameterized by this value W here, which is very close to minus one, and you can see here. We see no evidence for new types of ultralight particles, such as neutrinos, so the number of effective particles is still of the order three. No evidence for variation of the fundamental constants of nature, in particular fine structure constant, which actually describes the, the, all the uh, electric structure, uh, electromagnetic structure of, uh, of atoms and, 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 and matter in general. Uh, no evidence yet for primordial gravitational waves, we have an upper limit. And the fluctuations are random and Gaussian. Of course, all these, uh, in particular, last one poses uh, constraints in several models and several models of inflation as well. However, and I'm almost finished here, we find anomalies. And uh, there are small deviations from these uh, otherwise perfect picture. And these, these anomalies are prompting us to find new ways to explain what we see. So one of them is that when you look at power spectrum in very large angular scales, and if you look at power spectrum and this green curve, you see there is a bit of deficiency of power. So um, it does not fit that well in that very large angular scale. Okay? So there is something there not, not, not yet completely right. On the other hand, Planck map reveals peculiar structures uh, that we call anomalies. One of them is the existence of a cold uh, hot spot down here. And this cold hot spot is a spot, it's not because it's cold, it's because it extends for a region, an area of the sky that is larger than expected within the, 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 our standard model. We find a hemispherical asymmetry. So light patterns are asymmetric on two halves of the sky. And I'm going to single this one out just to give an example here. And if you look at these two halves of the sky, and we look at them, they look different. It seems that left hemisphere, if I can use a topographical uh, uh, an uh, analogy, is that you can see that the peaks of the mountains are higher, and the seas are uh, deeper on the left inside hemisphere than on the right inside hemisphere. This is a feature that was noticed before, but considered controversial. It's been confirmed now by, by Planck. And the question to ask is, does this call for new physics? Note that we are looking at very large angular scale features. So we are actually peaking into a, 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 a very, very early time. So this is giving a pristine image, if you want, of the very, very early universe. So just to finish here, we have learned a great deal about our universe. And it's almost 15 years since the discovery of the CMB. And after scores of suborbital CMB experiments and two decades of three dedicated satellite missions, we reach a remarkable moment. And in, there is no doubt that it has taken 20, us 20 years to get to this point, of course. And one might ponder what our knowledge of the universe will look like in 20 years' time. Yeah, it will be interesting to see. 
However, some basic mysteries still remain. Why is the universe the way that it is? How the universe originated? Does the universe look the same in all directions? This way is it isotropic at large angular scales? That is, at very, very early times. Is it a coincidence that it just seems right for us to live in? Indeed, aren't we lucky? Because one thing we know for sure is that we are here. And an indication that the universe supports the presence of life. Thank you very much. Finish here.